Out of just such an eruption of the earth a million or more years ago was born Japan, land of the little people who grew to believe that in blood and iron lay the shortcut to greatness. Land of philosophies and religions stranger than their names, like Bushido, the medieval code of slicing a victim with a samurai sword. The truth of that one they were to discover. Old Japan was primitive. The history of the new Japan is a story of successful copying. On a tradition of peace and love of the soil, the new Japan suddenly turned its back and copied our locomotives, our planes, our great ocean-going liners. Even Tokyo might have been transplanted bodily from the Western world. <laughs> Japan's plans for world conquest were financed by the fine thread of an industrious caterpillar woven into silk and stamped made in Japan for its English-speaking customers. Soft silk sent away for hard scrap iron to be forged into weapons and returned to us eventually in hate. How will it end for the little people who wanted to enslave the world? The answer to that was to come, like the answer to all things, from the sky. Only when it came, it was to be stamped, made in America. As it was, for instance, on Doolittle Day, when the hornet, the first Shangri-La, pointed her prow right at the heart of Tokyo. This was the first brief answer to Japan that came from the skies. It was not to be the last. General Doolittle vowed, We're going back to Tokyo, and we shall go in full array and with mighty allies. A weapon was ready. Through these forbidding doors, ceaselessly, day and night, come trains bearing the materials that skill weld, forge, and rivet into an instrument dedicated to the destruction of the enemy. This is only one of many plants that one day appeared where just the day before, it seemed, was pasture land, or the place where they were building washing machines. When the workers reported for the first time, few of them guessed the exact nature of what they were building. They knew that a giant plane would result, but beyond that it was largely conjecture. But then the day came, inevitably, when the pieces of their jigsaw began to fit together. The day when the mountains of material and the millions of man-hours all combined to confirm the assembly line rumor, the washroom gossip, and their honest-to-God American curiosity. They were building the mightiest aircraft in history. They were building a plane for the Army Air Forces that would reduce the huge fortresses and liberators to medium bombers. They were building the Boeing-designed B-29 Super Fortress. A 
and this is how they built it. Enough aluminum is stored here to lay a silver carpet over every street in Tokyo. Aluminum sheet to be brought to life by these machines and the workers who operate them. They give it shape and personality. Their stamping machines, their presses, lathes and drills, coax it and pound it and pierce it into the multiple patterns prescribed in 50 tons of blueprints. It was bauxite a month ago, dead in the ground. Miners dug it out of the Arkansas hills. And then in some distant factory, bauxite came in at one end and aluminum sheet rolled out the other. One day from now, in the stratosphere above the clouds, it will mirror the sun. In a month, out of the ground and into the sky. These will be the wings to take it there. From the confusion of manpower and equipment within this massive jig will emerge the fabulous 117, a wing of completely new design, which will carry more weight, faster and higher than any other wing. The jigs themselves, the fixtures and the tools were designed so that unskilled workers could be expert with them in a week, whether they were farmers or clerks, cotton pickers or housewives, salesmen or ex-soldiers. The wing is of awesome weight and dimension, yet a girl can lift it with about the same effort that she would need to adjust the flower in her hair. Space and the handling of bulky parts have always been problems in assembly production. The engineers who designed this plant solved both problems at once with a few strokes on their drafting boards. They moved traffic to the ceiling. Thus, they allowed workers more time at machines and machines more time at work. Here is the wing in a more advanced stage. If the workers imagined for a moment that they were in a shipyard, it would be understandable. The Mayflower was shorter from stem to stern than each of these wings from tip to tip. All the pilgrims who landed at Plymouth Rock could curl up within the gasoline compartments in the wing and sleep no less comfortably than on their long Atlantic crossing. Each of these nacelles will encase an engine of 2,200 horsepower, four of them harnessed to one super fortress, 8,800 horsepower. What does that mean? Horsepower means more than 300 miles an hour. Horsepower means flying high enough to see all the New England states at once. Horsepower means victory in the air. When these skeleton nose sections are enclosed in aluminum and glass, they will be the most comfortable cockpits a bomber ever had. The windows cannot cloud or frost. The pilot's instrument panel is less complex than the dashboard of an automobile. Soundproofing allows talk without the interphone. And because the entire compartment is a pressurized tank, the air remains practically constant, from prairie level to the rarefied atmosphere over the Himalayas. Back of the control cabin is the huge center section. Here the wings will be set. Here the bomb bays will hold the greatest weight of death ever lifted into the skies. Toward the tail, another big pressurized chamber will house the rest of the crew, except the rear gunner who has a cabin to himself. If in some stratospheric emergency, a crew member must travel between front and rear pressurized compartments, he can slither through this connecting tunnel. An armor glass observation blister. Durable, crystal clear, eyes of every super fortress. The prefabricated sub-assemblies are manufactured by other contractors and shipped to this plant by the carload. What has been shown here is being duplicated in plants all across the country. Identical miracles of modern machinery, nursed and tended and made productive by people who look and think like these people. The fair, the dark, people with deft hands and unblinking eyes. 
the strong with their willing muscles, and those less strong, but as willing, the braided schoolgirls, the white-haired grandmothers, the old young, the young old, the little ones, and the less little ones, working together in intimate harmony, their product, death, their goal, peace. These workers are the lucky ones who see the finished product of their labor roll off the line. Every hour of every day, they are witness to this awe-inspiring ceremony, this tremendous wedding of material and man hours, this climax in the history of man's conquest of the air. <laughs> But what of the others who helped, however remotely, to create an aerial weapon they have never seen? The lumberjack who felled the trees that became the blueprints of the B-29. The bauxite miner in the Arkansas hills, and the miner of iron and coal. The builder of guns and engines and propellers. The grimy, sweating men who cast the cylinders and forged the crankshaft. The maker of tires, electrical equipment, instruments and safety wires. The citizens who paid for the super fortress with their purchases of war bonds. Theirs are isolated lines of effort, initiated all across the land and converging eventually beneath this vaulted roof. Here, the sum of their energies assumes shape and stature and meaning. Here is the final meeting of every effort and every part. A bold insignia will proclaim to the enemy that this is the proud new weapon of the United States Army Air Forces. But it is our plane too, because we the people built it. We conceived it, financed it, gave it wing. We powered it and armed it, and our sons and brothers fly it. The function of the people's super fortress is to break the race who turn their backs on reason, to spin them around to face the peaceful way of living. It is the people's answer to all the sneak raids, all the death marches, all the stabs in the back. It is our memorial to the fighting men who were not afraid to die, who bought with their lives at the time we needed to make the weapons to win the war. Like this weapon, which 50 hours after its test will be landing in India or China or some other far away Shangri-La to regain its breath before the final assault for which the people destined it. Within the plant, work proceeds. But the workers cock their ears for a sound that regularly drowns the clatter of their tools. It's more than a sound. It is a song. This is the song they hear. The story begins in 1939, when the far-sighted Army Air Forces said, we want a plane for our defense that can fly a bomb load thousands of miles out to sea and return. After six months' work, there was a tiny model which spent the next six months in a wind tunnel. And then there was a full-scale model which was subjected to every punishment man could devise for it. Only after a year of such tests, did the Air Forces let contracts for planes that would be built to fight. 
The B-25 Mitchell is a big strapping bomber. 67 feet across the wings, but it could reach Japan only if it took off from an aircraft carrier. Much bigger is the famed B-17 Fortress. 104 feet from wingtip to wingtip, it has ranged 1,400 miles over Japan's island conquest. But it cannot reach Japan itself from any base we now hold. The Super Fortress. Wingspan, 141 feet. Longer than the Wright's first flight through the air at Kitty Hawk. Range, altitude, and bomb load, secret. Though the Air Forces do say of them laconically. Very long, very high, and very large. Because it is a global bomber, around it has been built an entire new Air Force, the 20th. The 20th War Theater is the world itself. Its operations room is the war room of the Chiefs of Staff in Washington. Its planes will be treated as a major task force in the same manner as a naval task force is directed against a specific objective. Watch it come in for a landing. A revolutionary set of flaps that constitutes nearly one-fifth of the wing area gives the ship a low landing speed and a shorter landing run than many a plane half its size. All this great weight of Super Fortress is supported by a tricycle gear whose tires require less pressure than a child's bicycle. Somewhere in western China, half a million nameless people wrote their magnificent chapter in the saga of the Super Fortress. Two thousand years after their ancestors built the Great Wall for the defense of China, these farmers transformed saturated rice paddies into airfields for offense against a new invader. They had no machinery as we know it, only their million hands and a searing memory of anguished years since Japan set out to annihilate them. Stone by stone, layer after layer, bound together not just with muddy water, but with the blood of their brothers who died under the samurai sword. And soon there were runways to bear the weight of a whole fleet of super fortresses. Revenge for the nameless people was close at hand. Even in China, land of miracles, the arrival of a super fortress is an occasion for everyone to turn out in curiosity and in welcome. A welcome now, but journey's end on the other side of the globe is only the beginning of another, grimmer journey. The tanks will have to be filled, the engines given a final check, the guns armed, the bombs set in the racks, and then briefing. And the assembled airmen will listen to words that a few years ago would have been fantastic, but today roll casually off a briefing officer's lips. The target, gentlemen, is Japan.
we buried B-29 Super Fortress, now a decaying hulk. It once crippled an empire, and in a single stroke of terror, ended a war and changed a world forever. Its recurring echo still sounds from those gone, but not forgotten days. April 1942, under the command of Colonel James H. Doolittle, 16 B-25B Mitchell bombers lifted off the rolling deck of the U.S. carrier Hornet. With a belly full of bombs and fuel, they were bound for the Japanese home islands, the first direct bombing assault on Tokyo. It proved a costly but needed boost to Allied confidence, but demonstrated a desperate inadequacy, a strategic long-range bomber, a weapon foretold in Doolittle's post-mission statement. We are going back to Tokyo, and we shall go in full array and with mighty allies. The B-24 Liberator, an extremely versatile bomber, could not meet the range, speed, altitude, and load requirements now envisioned by the War Department. Neither could the B-17 Flying Fortress, another magnificent plane. While they flew countless successful missions over Europe, they were already being outloaded by designs on the drawing boards back home. The huge Douglas XB-19, first flown in 1941, was a flying laboratory to test the principles of big aircraft. In 1940, the War Department called for a bomber capable of speeds, altitudes, loads and ranges that the underpowered 19 couldn't match. It became a competition between the Consolidated and Boeing companies. A Consolidated B-32 Dominator powered by four Wright R3350 engines specified for use by the War Department. It was pressurized, and below large, it was not seen to break any major new ground. It would just fulfill specifications, but offering little more than a conservative step forward. Adopted as an insurance policy, if the radical Boeing Model 345 failed, only 15 B-32s saw active duty, although over 100 were built. The winning design was the Boeing Giant, designated XB-29, top speed over 350 miles per hour, ceiling over 30,000 feet, range approximately 4,000 miles with a 10,000 ton payload. The main fight of the first XB-29 was on September the 21st, 1942, over Boeing Field, Seattle. Test pilot Eddie Allen reported that low horsepower was a problem, but in flight, the big aircraft handled superbly. The early Sperry gun system and three-bladed props seen here were not incorporated in later models. Much important data was obtained from this first XB-29. Not so with the next XB. On its second flight, it burst into flames. Eddie Allen, his 10 crew and 19 civilians perished. Such horrifying losses were not allowed to impede a project which the war depended on. The XBs were soon back flying. The B-25 Mitchell is a big strapping bomber. 67 feet across the wings, but it could reach Japan only if it took off from an aircraft carrier. Much bigger is the famed B-17 Fortress. 104 feet from wing tip and tip, it has ranged 1,400 miles over Japan's island conquests. But it cannot reach Japan itself from any base we now hold. The Super Fortress, wingspan 141 feet, longer than the Wright's first flight through the air at Kitty Hawk. Range, altitude and bomb load, secret. By June 1942, the first of 14 pre-production drab painted YB-29s were airborne. The theories of the radical design on trial. The 29's huge bomb bays were set forward and aft of center of gravity maintained stability during drops, and its volometer released payload from alternate bays. Inside, crew quarters were heated, pressurized, and soundproofed. In the forward compartment, the bombardier sits in the extreme nose of the plane, below and between the pilot and co-pilot. The pilot sits on the left, the co-pilot on the right. 
a navigator is behind the pilot, facing forward. A flight engineer is behind the co-pilot, facing aft. The radio operator is behind the flight engineer, facing right. In the aft compartment, along with the rest area, are the gun commander in a barber's chair, observing through a plexiglass blister atop the aircraft. The two side gunners to the left and right of him. The tail gunner, mans the putt putt auxiliary starter motor. His normal position is in the pressurized tail compartment. The huge wings set mid-fuselage were quite radical. Boeing departed from the conventional bridge truss configuration, settling on a web-type structure. Flaps increased wing area by as much as one-fifth for low-speed flight, takeoff and landings. The retractable twin-wheeled tricycle landing gear was a great advantage for such a heavy aircraft during high-speed landing runs, even after extensive combat damage. The 29 used another innovation, the General Electric Remote Gummery Control System. All guns were sighted and fired remotely. Four of the turrets, two on top and two beneath the fuselage, can turn through 360 degrees in azimuth, 90 degrees in elevation. The tail turret is more restricted in movement, but it has a 20 millimeter cannon in addition to the twin 50s the others carry. But the big thing about the 29's armament is the fact that the gunners don't touch the guns. The guns are controlled remotely from special sites, and any gunner can fire almost any turret. For example, one side gunner might have control of two turrets, firing four caliber 50s at his target. A small central computer made corrections for wind, temperature, altitude, speed, and extended range by correcting for bullet drop. Gunners using this remote system experienced no jarring recoil and gun vibration, easing the task of holding a target in sight. Gun camera footage of fighters shot down is terrifying me real. A camera is activated by the firing mechanism. It is seen here mounted between the twin machine guns of the aft lower turret. Long high altitude flights called for pressurization. The 29's circular cross section hull gave a necessary uniform strength. A Boeing auto pressure regulator controlled pressurization. The fact that it was pressurized and the altitude was brought down to simulate 8,000 feet, that whenever any kind of a window pops out or a rupture from, uh, if it in combat, uh, in the uh, fuselage would cause a sudden rush of air out of that to equalize the pressure. And uh, especially when you're at higher altitudes in the thin atmosphere. And so because we had to travel from the forward deck to the back over the bomb bay through a tunnel, which was a little bit confining in that you couldn't wear your parachute with you, but while you're in that tunnel, if you should suddenly depressurize at that time, you got the feeling that you might be a projectile in a cannon going shot right through the tunnel. So it was a little apprehensive about going in there at times, especially at high altitudes. The massive engines were at the time the most complex and powerful ever built. Four Wright R3350 radials, turbo supercharged to produce 2,200 horsepower. The huge props were geared to rotate very slowly for high altitude performance. This was a very special aircraft. Spurred on by Pearl Harbor, the US now geared up for wartime production. By January 1942, B-29 orders were doubled to 500. Labor shortages foreseen. Processes were simplified for unskilled workers. Designs were broken down into components for allocation to many production facilities throughout the US. Final assembly production lines also spanned the nation. 1,600 B-29s would be ordered
but not all was in the swing. The B-29 project had slowed to a crawl, crippled by its vast logistic and organizational problems. The Battle of Kansas was about to be fought. The difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. The situation was that the B-29 had to be sent to war within a specified time. And uh, it was the job of the people uh, under the command of Arnold to make that happen. So they ended up with a situation where they had approximately five weeks to get the B-29 into action. And unfortunately, they found the worst weather conditions possible. They had problems with transportation of parts. And uh, they also were dealing with a situation where they had partly trained crews who were trying to complete modifications to the airplane. Um, as things went wrong and had to be replaced, these crews learned on the job. And you had a situation, for instance, where they were fitting modified radar sets, but they had never fitted radar sets before of any kind. Under direct presidential pressure, Arnold stepped in. It said 60 armchair generals turned up to impress him, but he meant business. Signing the 175th 29, Arnold demanded it be ready by March the 1st, 1944. By the 28th of February, the Hap Arnold Special plus all 29s ahead of it had been rolled out. Before the Super Fortress deployment to India and the Pacific, an elaborate cover plan was executed. Obo Queen, the only YB to see active duty, was sent to India via England. It toured the UK for two weeks in an attempt to mislead the Axis to believe the 29 was to be used in Europe. Not an hour after landing, a German reconnaissance aircraft was seen flying overhead. China, the focus of Japanese aggression for many years. Here was an opportunity to straight back. Mainland China offered forward bases close to Japan for the new B-29s bound for permanent bases in India. The Pacific posed the problems that bore the concept of the 29. The B-17 and B-24 had both proven great aircraft over Europe with shorter distances from base to target. The Pacific posed huge logistic problems, vast expanses of ocean that conventional warfare had not yet encountered. The B-29 was simply the only aircraft that could reach Japan. The 20th Bomber Command was specifically created to hold the B-29s together as a single force to strike Japan. The 58th Very Heavy Bombardment Wing was made up of the 40th, 444th, 462nd and 468th Bombardment Groups. They were bound for the heat and dust of India half a world away. Travelling east, the first stop, Ganda Bay, Newfoundland. Across the Atlantic to Marrakesh, Cairo, Karachi, and finally Calcutta. In preparation, thousands of Indian workers and US construction troops had upgraded Indian airstrips to take the big bombers. The bases were scattered around northeast India at Karangapur, Chakulia, Piadoba, and Dudkindi. The forward bases in China lay on the plains of Chengdu, just in range of the southern islands of Japan. From Calcutta, everything had to be ferried in a massive airlift operation across the jagged peaks and deep gorges of the Himalayas, a treacherous pump covered in ice and cloud that lay before the vast plains of Chengdu and the forward bases. Converted 29 tankers flew the route, three gallons used for every one gallon of fuel offloaded at Chengdu. Four airstrips were constructed, each 8,500 feet long, to service the huge bombers. Each rock was turned into handmade gravel to fill and flatten the old rice paddies. China mobilized its one huge resource, people. Over a third of a million laborers worked on the construction, using simple barrows, buckets, and wooden tools to reform the landscape. Fighter aircraft also had to be accommodated. Strips were built for them in southwest China. These rollers weighed up to 10 tons 
and were awed by as many as 100 men. But all this cost money. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek charged the US government over $200 million in gold for the effort. By April 1944, B-29s were landing in China, ready for the raids of June. Raids that would prove disappointing. Along distances, much at high altitude, in the treacherous Himalayas, the golden airstrips of Ching Tu transform into $200 million barks by torrential rain. The initial conception of a B-29 could be self-supporting a fallacy. A fuel run across the hump couldn't keep up with demand. After the first wave of June the 14th, raids were held up for a protracted period as there were only 5,000 gallons of suitable fuel in the whole of China. These bases would not spell the defeat of Japan. There were many raids from these Chinese bases, but ranged from China limited targets, the 29s just being able to reach the southern tip of Japan, only biting at its heels. The turning point came mid-1944, when after much bitter fighting the Marianas Islands were wrested from the Japanese. The loss caused the fall of the Tojo cabinet. These were, for the B-29s, the stepping stones to Tokyo. The three islands, Guam, Saipan and Tinia, were only 1,500 miles from Japan. Construction of five B-29 bases on the three islands commenced, whom's working hard coral formations into airstrips through tropical heat and sudden rainstorms. On October 12, 1944, the first B-29 landed on Isley Airfield, Saipan. Jarton Josie, the Pacific pioneer, carried the new commander of the 21st Bomber Command, Brigadier General Haywood S. Hansel. As Arnold's chief of staff in Washington, he directed the India-China offensive. He would now control the 21st of the Marianas. <laughs> Well, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talking. Ansel was a planner and a staunch believer in strategic high-altitude precision bombardment. The bombs rained down on industrial and economic targets throughout Japan, but results were again poor. B-29 losses grew as the enemy concentrated defensive fighter squadrons around these targets. The high altitudes the B-29s had to climb for such raids were causing huge operational difficulties, many aircraft ditching on the long journey back to the Marianas. Arnold needed results. Amsel was relieved of his command, Arnold replacing him with General Curtis E. LeMay. Maybe this man could turn the tide. Iwo Jima captured soon after LeMay's appointment. The island sits around halfway from the Marianas to Tokyo. Japanese held, it was taken by U.S. Marines in February-March 1945 with a tremendous loss of life. The still hot volcanic rock of Iwo Jima was carved into an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Now there was a safety stop in emergencies, fighter escorts for the B-29s, and Japan was being pushed back at last. LeMay, not a devotee to any specific tactical doctrine, but try new ideas to get results. Ideas that would eventually burn the heart out of Japan. I'd say that they respected and feared him, but they knew that he could do the job and hopefully would keep them alive. Uh, previously, they'd been suffering serious losses in the B-29s, and uh, LeMay came along, changed the tactics, made the airplane work. LeMay found that Hansel had built the B-29 bases in the Marianas into a well-organized war machine. The Navy had shipped in massive stockpiles of cargo to service the vast armada, safely out of range of Japanese attacks. LeMay could see no reason for the 29's failure to perform, apart from the tactical use. He had the weapon. It was a case of using it in the right manner, efficiently and to its full devastating potential. LeMay would at first allow missions to continue as before, daylight rays hitting from high altitude in formation using heavy explosives. He would observe the characteristics of the missions and devise a startling plan. B-29 
missions were planned in great detail, and the map rooms collated huge amounts of data. Here was the control center for all B-29 operations against Japan. Even as these bombs rained down on Japan's cities, LeMay had pieced together the Offensive of Fire, a campaign that in just 11 days would put to the torch 29 square miles of urban area. In the following months, more fire raids paired with an extensive aerial mining campaign would choke and starve the nation. Removing war guns and ammunition except the tail armament and leaving the gunners behind would mean a huge saving of weight allowing more payload, the new M69 in century firebombs. At night, the 29s would approach the target at five to 8,000 feet in single fire, guided by Pathfinder B-29s, marking the target with a huge cross of fire. We may observe that Japanese anti-aircraft guns were not greatly effective at low to medium altitudes, and their night fighter capabilities were very limited. Lower altitudes meant more range, neither three times greater payload and less strain on the engine team. Flying back to the Marianas after missions, the crews now had the haven of Iwo Jima for emergency landings. Many dropped in where before it was a long nip home, with every chance of a ditching in the vast Pacific and little chance of rescue. Iwo was a godsend. Iwo was the long flight back to Tinian, Saipan, and Guam.
class 29s returned safely to flyer gear. But not all were nearly so lucky. This is not Hiroshima. In one night, nearly 16 square miles, 25% of all the buildings in Tokyo were destroyed. One million harmless, 150,000 dead, injured or missing. The LeMay treatment was a terrifying success. The bases in the Pacific were no island parents, sometimes hot and dusty, sometimes wet and muddy. Low morale was ever present, men living close together in tent cities, a cargo culture far from home, and the ominous fear of not returning for the next mission. The B-29 became a part of the crew. Hampered like a new Cadillac, a certain amount of customizing went on. For example, the official decision to remove the 20 mm tail cannon was not seen by some crews as a desirable step. The twin 50 machine guns alone would certainly not be much of a discouragement to enemy fighters. Just the sight of this monster cannon kept fighters well out of range of its non-existent steam. Customizing of another kind was the famous V-29 nose art. When the order came to remove the nose art, there was a ripple of discontent. But in a military situation, orders were orders. Where the order came from, nobody really seems to know. There is one version that says that a number of B-29s went back to the United States and when the nose art was seen, there were objections to the uh, lurid nature of it and therefore the order came back to the people in the combat zone to remove it. Other Versions of that story are that it was decided at the group level by the group commanders. Some wanted to run a cleaner operation than others. A men's high regard for their aircraft made their loss seem even greater. Jot and Josie. On April Fool's Day 1945, a small explosion was seen shortly after takeoff. She burst into flames, plunging into the bay of Saipanan. Super Wabaton lost February 19th, 1945. A Japanese suicide attack tore off both wings. She went down. No survivors. Little Joe. His over Mia Kanojo on April the 29th, 1945. The crew bailed out. Only six of the 11 men were rescued. Nose art gave them names to be remembered by. But this is surely the most unforgettable name of them all. On the 16th of July, 1945, US scientists exploded the first atomic device. In under one month, a modified B-29 of the specially created 509th Composite Group would carry the 9,700 pounds uranium bar high above the city of Hiroshima. After a photographing session that make it, made us feel like a Hollywood premiere, we uh, got off at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, darkness, and headed for Iwo Jima, which we reached about sunrise. We made uh, certain adjustments and tests on the bomb during that flight. We then headed for the Empire. And, uh, the weather improved as we went along. We felt that it was our lucky day. We knew it was as we made the final approach toward Hiroshima, which the navigator hit right on the button. Bombardier took over, identified the target, and everything went with perfection not approached in the rehearsal. The bomb was finally released exactly at the designated hour and the explosion occurred as planned. Uh, my navigator had me perfectly lined up with the target. When I touched in with my sight, I could clearly see the city of Hiroshima within my bomb sight. Then I touched in and took the run and I felt the bump of the airplane. I was greatly relieved because I knew the unit had gone from the airplane that we had successfully delivered. It meant so much to the Army Air Forces, American science, and industry. The bomb was armed in flight by Captain Parsons to avoid any mishap on takeoff. And all again flew unopposed in all the Hiroshima. Well, 
Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. After we uh, felt the uh, explosion hit the airplane, that is the concussion waves, uh, we knew that the bomb had explosion, had exploded, everything was a success. So we turned around to take a look at it. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. At 9.15 on the morning of the 6th of August, 1945, 4.5 square miles of Hiroshima and 78,000 of its inhabitants ceased to exist. Japan in shock couldn't come to a decision on peace. The B-29 boxcar carried the second bomb over Nagasaki. Another city disappeared. Fears of death on the war's last days were fueled as bombing went on after Nagasaki. All bombers were turned as peace was declared. A war was over, but the B-29 still had much to accomplish. When a post-war surplus of 29s variants appeared, a Pekusen Dreamboat was a B-29B, modified for long-distance flight, stripped bare inside, extra fuel tanks installed, and the gump chinless nacelles fitted, and cars filled with low white helium. It was to break the world distance flight record in November of 1945. A flying fuel tank flew 8,198 miles. In 1946, on the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific, the B-29 atomic bomber would launch the tests of a more powerful A-bomb. Arriving aboard the B-29, the outlaw, a familiar face, General LeMay, now Deputy Chief of Staff of Research. A Marshall group 5,000 miles from the U.S., surrounded by vast stretches of ocean. A first test target, Akidi Atoll. The B-29 Dave's Dream was specially modified to hold the test bomb in its bay. It would deliver the payload over a target of 93 unmanned naval vessels clustered around a tiny atoll. Other 29s would act as weather planes, flying laboratories, and photographic platforms. Unmanned, radio-controlled B-17 drones would fly through the fallout cloud to collect samples. Naval observation ships sat 40 miles from aim point. At 34 seconds past 9 a.m. July the 1st, the atoll and the metal target ships were rocked by a massive blast. The D-29 was the true pioneer of USAF in-flight refueling systems. In this drogue probe system, fuel was transferred down a long hose to receiver aircraft. A pilot having to close in to the end drogue with the probe, seat here on the weak tip. Much more successful was the Boeing patented flying boom. A rigid telescopic tube was literally flown into position by an operator in the old tail cut compartment. An aerodynamic D-shaped wing at the tip of the arm allowed steering. A paddle of lights on the belly of the 29 gave the receiver pilot instructions to hold position. During normal flight, the arm could be pivoted under the tail. Coupling and decoupling can be seen closer in this footage of a KC-97 tanker and an early B-52 using the flying boom system pioneered by the B-29. The Soviets had a B-29 of their own. The Tupolev Tu-4 was a direct copy of B-29s it turned during the war. 
1,200 were built. The Hap Arnold Special was ironically one of the 29s methodically taken to pieces and copied, alt for bot. The SB-29 Super Dumbo was basically a B-29 equipped with survival and rescue gear. Its main feature was an A-3 lifeboat carried under the fuselage, which could be dropped to down crews. Sixteen SB conversions were carried out. A huge A-3 lifeboat must have been a blessing to count, as it was motorized and carried all manner of survival equipment. Coastline in 1947, the B-29D's designation was changed to B-50. The B-50 had a much stronger airframe. Weighted models had 700-gallon wing tanks and a one-piece plexiglass nose gun. Its Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines produced 3,500 horsepower. A huge tail had a folding tip to allow entry into USAF Nagas. With the B-50 and new B-36 in their arsenal, the USAF could afford to loan the RAF 87 B-29s, designated the Washington Bomber. The B-50, the first aircraft to circumnavigate the globe non-stop, was the final variant of the B-29. In the late 40s, the Super Fort would play another crucial role in the advancement of aviation this time as a mothership for early experimental supersonic aircraft. At the Air Force Flight Test Center, Edwards Air Force Base, the Bell rocket-powered research aircraft X-1 would attempt to break the sound barrier. A B-29 was used to air-launch the parasite aircraft around 30,000 feet. In a series of flights, USAF test pilot Major Chuck Yeager took the X-1 Glamorous Glennis up close to the sound barrier. On the 14th of October 1947, Jaeger punched the X-1 beyond Mark I into the smooth airflow of supersonic flight. So began a string of B-29 parasite launches that changed the face of aviation technology. The loading of these X-planes was quite interesting, as the huge B-29 had to be elevated on stilts. The parasite X-plane was rolled underneath and hoisted clear of the ground and recessed into the modified bomb bays. Another peculiar parasite aircraft was tested from a B-29. The XF-85 Goblin air-launched fighter was designed to be carried by the Convair B-36. The Goblin could be launched then picked up after completing its mission. When war broke out in Korea in 1950, the B-29 was to play an active and crucial role in support of the UN troops. Used mainly in obedient level interdiction role, it destroyed bridges, roads, and enemy communication lines. But the Super Fortress dealt many a harsh blow, dropping 167,000 tons of bombs in 21,328 sorties. They operated on all but 26 days of the war, shut down over 30 fighters. 34 Super Forts were lost in all. B-29 also deployed the mammoth Tarzan, radio-controlled bombs, a devastating effect. 
in the heat of Korea, nose art surfaced again. Her 29s were soon adorned with pretty girls and comic characters. By the end of the Korean War, in 1953, the B-29 was deemed obsolescent. It was soon relegated to only second-line duties. Last operational B-29 flew its final mission, a routine radar evaluation flight, on the 21st of June, 1960. I think the, the crews who were flying the B-29s were proud of the fact that they were flying the most advanced aircraft in the world at the time. and. In one specific case, a pilot who flew B-29s during World War II has always insisted that when he flies on an airline, it must be an airline flying Boeing planes. We more or less had the feeling that we were having the Cadillacs of airplanes. It was the, the uh, super bomber. And because of that, we were all quite proud. And it was a good plane. <laughs> 